professionally to try and tell storytelling that has, has had a really powerful effect uh, uh, and very powerful positive effect on people for, for tens of millions of people and that, and that continues to expand. And that's part of what we do at Julio is help, which is help uh, is support these extraordinary writers. Um, and if you haven't heard uh, Revisionist History, Malcolm's uh, really amazing podcast, you, you should uh, right away. It's really a, a Virginia Heffernan, uh, you may have known as a, as a, a, a wonderful writer uh, for many years here, but she has really exploded onto the scene with her new book, Magic and Law, which I, I, I was telling her earlier, I've never seen such an extraordinary succession of reviews for a book. Um, and actually, unbeknownst to her, the subtitle of the book made, it pop, made this event possible because there were some questions as to whether this conversation was adequately artful. And the subtitle of Magic and Law is The Internet as Art. So now that Virginia has authoritatively established this internet as art, all of our subsequent events will truly also be uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, Among the many extraordinary things that have been said about Virginia lately is she's been described as one of the best living writers of English prose. It's not clear to me, it's not clear to me who, who said that. I looked for the very next question. It's an it's uncle. It wasn't a relative. <laughs> yeah, he's an uncle by marriage, and it was on Twitter. <laughs> you still have to have verse to conquer and a bunch of other things. True, right. But it's an extraordinary book. Um, with no further ado, uh, Virginia Dawson. We uh, went about this, the preparation in the Trump way, not the Hillary way, meaning um, in the last seven, eight minutes, we yeah. scribbled down ideas. No, we, the, <laughs> given the, can you, can you hear me? No. no. Oh. None of us. These okay. might not be on. Details. Is, are we, are we, we're live on Facebook, right? They don't let you get away with stuff like no. this, too. Oh, there <laughs> Given the, uh, the, um, uh, the enormousness of the topic, the internet as art, and uh, we thought we would um, do something a little bit uh, fun. We would simply uh, go back and forth uh, asking each other one word questions. <laughs> and uh, the conversation will flow from there. So I, th I think I'm gonna start. I, th I like it. I think it's a little bit competitive. It's a little bit competitive. And um. I mean, as you know, I we've known each other 20 years. I wrote one book in the 20 years. Um, Malcolm's had a lot of career setbacks. So, um, <laughs> in order just to sort of equally weight things, I feel like we need to take into account he needs a lot of applause tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you, Virginia. All right, my first one-word question for you, Virginia, is Athena. Athena, my very first online handle. I was nine years old. Um, we had, um, it was ARPANET era, 1979, and um, as luck would have it, John Kemeny, one of the co-authors of BASIC, insisted that my colonial college town, um, Dartmouth College was there, he was the president of the college. Um, he really wanted the real estate to put in a mainframe in town, and um, this town was very protective of its school children and worried that we would maybe get a special raise in our brains from the mainframe. And so he, in exchange for putting in this computer, he had to make a promise to the parents and school children that we could, um, that he would give us Electron Basics so we could do everyone's greatest, we would get, like fulfill every parent's greatest expectation in 1979, which was work for NASA. If we could learn basic, we could work for NASA. So Wait, you I did. Worked for NASA in 1979 as a nine. As Athena, and thus endeth our story. Yes, um, <laughs> I, um, I. So I signed on to the. I dialed into the this mainframe with the idea that I was going to um, learn basic and work for NASA, and got waylaid, as I would venture to say, all of us did by chat, the fundamental function <laughs> of the internet. Um, and I, I, I thought of some slightly less. Um, defensive and grandiose handles since Athena. Why um, did you choose Athena, by the way? Okay, I was nine, chubby <laughs> and freckled, <laughs> and I really wanted to splash on the scene and talk about Reaganomics with people. <laughs> um, and so as a, just as an authority gathering measure, 
you know, on Second Life, when you put on armor, it's like, you know, yeah. you don't go on, especially yeah. in Nine, you don't go on as like, sad brunette girl. <laughs> you know, that's later. <laughs> 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 All right, so that's Athena. Um, I got to ask you about Jam Guy. Jam Guy, uh, my first uh, screen name. Uh, uh, I'm 20 years later than you, late, no, mid, mid 90s. Uh, I was living on Duane Street, and I don't know why, but I was on Echo. Does anyone remember Echo? <laughs> yes. Uh, and my screen name on Echo was Jam Guy, which stands for, um, which my, my email address <laughs> after that was My Jamaican Guy. Where I I'm, first wrote to you. Because I am half Jamaican, and of course, the Grace, great Grace Jones song. Um, I've now dated myself so thoroughly <laughs> for those two admissions. Um, so anyway, my... my um, my screen name was Jam Guy, and I was on Echo. And Echo, as you may recall, was home to a series of extraordinarily <laughs> nerdy discussion groups. <laughs> and my one of my inaugural posts was about a one thousand word uh, 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 post on where exactly the uh, New York City could put a rail line to JFK Airport. <laughs> and I'll admit this: it was enormous. I was so proud of it. And then I logged back in, as one did, to see who had responded. And someone had just written below it, <laughs> Jam Guy posts for me. And I, I, was, I was filled with I mean, a kind of inexplicable and never before, never since equal joy. You had read. The world had, or at least one person had respo responded. To, and the thing was, of course, they had no idea who you were. You, that's right. right, but you would get us. You were sending a signal out to the universe, and the universe responded. Posts Jam for guy me. posts for me. Jam I am Spartacus. It's powerful. <laughs> I love it. I remember you as my Jamaican guy with some underscores, and um, I asked you if it was my Jamaican guy at AOL, and you you said not AOL, Hotmail. <laughs> <laughs> like it was mom. Well, I, I even to this day have an aversion to AOL. I'm not sure why that is, but it's a feature of all right. Um, uh, Virginia, 2026. Oh, what's next? Um, 10 years from now. 10 years from now. So I think we're, I, I, I hate to do this because we should feel like we're at the pinnacle of achievement right now, but I think we're in for a long time of anti-digital culture and I think it's digging in already. So things that can't be digitized um, from, from meaningful, beautiful things like mindfulness and, and foodism I hate Buddhism, but I know other people <laughs> like it. Um, th things that can't be digitized, and then to making your own ukuleles or whatever you guys do, <laughs> um, and um, and vinyl and live music, and um, and things that die in decay. In the book, I talk about um, I try I try to talk to vinyl fanatics and sound engineers about what's what's missing fr from MP3 sound and what the vinyl sound carries. And they're describing um, decay. They're describing the degradation of, of the signal. And um, it's sort of in my mind that the internet, you may know the people at Google are trying to really hack death. Like they're closing in on a set of supplements that um, <laughs> are gonna not slough off this mortal coil, but make there no mortal coils. <laughs> drop the mortal, I don't know. So drop Wait, the conceit of mortality. And, and uh, so I think what we miss are things that die, like each other. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that um, the LSD breakfast that some people in Silicon Valley are taking, um, they take it. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. I they take it. One. I don't think I have my phone, but okay. Do you all, can you all picture an iPhone interface? Um, and it's hard to call it to mind, but, um, but it, it, you know how it's like very orderly? That interface becomes, if you take LSD, so extraordinarily banal, you can hardly stand, your eyes slide off it, apparently. And the, <laughs> what they, the first guy that did it to break his Facebook and phone addiction said, the faces of people on the bus became so fascinating. He didn't want to look at Facebook. And I think you don't need the LSD. A face is a lot more interesting. interesting. I'm just looking at, I'm like looking at your, lines and it's <laughs> you just, like you look better than my I mean liniments not like wrinkles but I, you look better than my phone you look better than my, my phone yes very comforting um, <laughs> my <laughs> my what I wanted you to get at was can you um, we have a whole series of 
of social media platforms that are uh, dominate our imagination at the moment. And I'm, worried, I'm wondering about uh, how you think they will fare a decade into the future. Right. So will we care about Facebook 10 years from now? Facebook is a really wonderful retirement community now. <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> the, it used to have this youthful vibrancy, and fortunately, that's all gone. Um, and so you can just, like Gary Steingart or someone, you know, people just post pictures of their father, their late fathers, and um, tell you about them. And you just have reasoned conversations about between regular Republicans and Democrats. And there's not, you just, there's not a lot of pain there anymore. And I feel like it will sort of stay like that, like a kind of, just like a, like a, like isn't there a Nathaniel Hawthorne story where everyone dances and is dead forever. So I just feel like that's going to be Facebook. Um, <laughs> as for the other, I think Snapchat has done a wonderful job of um, creating things that die and vanish, which we didn't think we, we needed and craved, and, um, and now we do. Um, Instagram realized that unlike Flickr, unlike the Flickr aesthetic, that there was a desire for images that looked degraded, that looked like they'd, they, they were like Polaroids, that they'd been overexposed to sunlight or that they had actual mineral properties to them. Um, and, uh, and so I'm not sure if that will stay forever as a simulacrum of the, the dying world that I think we'll recover appreciation for or if we'll bounce off it entirely. You see a little of this with like the return of darkroom photography. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, as simply a network, like a, a means of exchange, you know, um, and YouTube, w I say in the book a lot about the PayPal diaspora that gave us Peter Thiel, but also gave us YouTube, that, you know, the idea that these are just units of exchange. So a photograph is a unit of exchange, a set of, a lump of text is a unit of exchange, an update, a tweet. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure what will ride those systems, but I think they'll continue at this kind of high velocity because at this point, it's like finance. It's you know, it's the way the world talks to itself. Yeah, um, I, I'm I'm very taken by. I read this book the other day about the history of the telephone. Love it. And the history of the telephone is really interesting because for basically the first from the 1880s through 90s through the 1920s, everyone involved with the telephone totally gets it wrong. Huh. So they think uh, in the beginning that it's just for business. Because so, they're obsessed with the telegram. The telegram was a business tool, largely. So they think the telephone's a business tool. So they get the whole thing about how you would call stores on the telephone. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense to them. But they don't get the thing that you would call your friend and gossip. And in fact, they actively discourage people from using the telephone for social purposes for literally the first 40 Is years of right? telephone's existence. Wow. And the other thing they don't get is they don't get they don't understand that it would be useful to people who live in the countryside. So they don't, yeah. because they don't understand its social nature, they don't understand its geographical function. So huh. as opposed to now, we're like, well, if you're living on a farm in Nebraska, of course the telephone is your lifeline to the world. Yeah. That takes a generation to emerge as, no one gets it. They think, oh, it's just urban. It's not, it's not rural at all. And they don't even string, it takes them forever, not for financial reasons, to string the countryside because they don't think the countryside they don't think is anyone needs it. it. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. A kind of, but reading that is very, <clears throat> if you're of the mind that we don't, as I, as I am, excuse me, that we don't get any smarter, um, then that's very sobering. So you think, well, if yeah. they didn't get the telephone for 40 years, what are we not getting about yeah. the internet? So when I look at Facebook, Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, my sort of base assumption is if they exist at all 10 years from now, they will exist in a way that is unrecognizable to us now. Yeah, yeah. But and I have no idea what that is. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, we can, we'll come back to that issue in a moment. Um, it's not every day someone jumps to her feet. Oh, that's very exciting. Uh, um, have we exhausted that topic? Of we yeah, but I like, I word? love, I, you know that I want to talk about communication across, across vast spaces like Nebraska or Canada. Um, um, Malcolm is Canadian, as he never fails to tell you. <laughs> um, and some, some of the great, wow, some of the great um, media theorists, most notably Malcolm, um, what am I saying? 
Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan. Um, is not me. Not you. Uh uh. Um, are um, is Canadian and 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 I th in the book I talk a little bit about how he derived his theories of of, um, of media from studies of the beaver trade in, in Canada because communication across vast distances are the first people that try to think of um, ways of communicating like drum beats and church bells are people that are not living right on top of each other um, and uh, and so. I think you're right. I mean, this thing about the telephone makes perfect sense to me that it, that you know they would forget to wire the places that needed it most. The yeah. same was a little bit true of cable television. Um, all right, next one. Hillary. I don't know what it's about. Edmund Hillary. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is my. Uh, I'm only. I'm not speaking about Hillary uh, globally. I'd rather very specifically and narrowly about the email controversy. This uh, has bothered me from the beginning, which is that. The, uh, the State Department um, was hacked first by, uh, first of course, of course all, the, all of our diplomatic cables were hacked by Mr. Snowden, et cetera. Then, two years ago, the State Department had to shut down its servers because they couldn't get rid of Russian malware. So we're at a situation, in a situation where <laughs> essentially the Contents of the files of the State Department are now in the public domain, and the servers are in the control of Russians. And in that situation, <laughs> the Secretary of State chooses to have some of her email reside on her BlackBerry. Um, and the only rational reading of that is that her information is more safe on her BlackBerry than it is on her State <laughs> Department server, right? So the whole controversy <laughs> is about getting upset at her for moving her information from a demonstrably unsafe place <laughs> to a safe place. Now, the only way you can have that conversation in public life is if your, your connection to the problem of uh, internet security is completely broken. Right. And this is, I'm obsessed with this fact. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that on, in one enormous, area, the internet is not just a failure, but a complete and utter fuck up. <laughs> it is a disaster. Every single day, someone hacks more information. Basically, it looks like there is no organization in the world that can effectively protect its data from someone who is determined to hack it, right? right. What else? What other? So the OPM hack two years ago, the, we think either the Chinese, probably the Chinese, made off with the contents, the, the files on 15 million Americans who applied for uh, national security clearance. When you apply for national security clearance, you tell the Office of Personnel and Management everything about yourself that can possibly be told, including right. every person of consequence you've had meaningful relationships with. In other words, what the Chinese got when they hacked all those 15 million was a download on what every person who was critical to our national defense Cares about, thinks about, right. has, talks to, right? Potential kidnapping. So that's the st that's the situation we're in. Now. Not just bank records, Yahoo, you know, healthcare records. By the way, it is now a routine occurrence for hospitals to have their routine occurrence to have their all of their medical records stolen by someone and held for ransom until a hospital pays. So. It, we're in a moment of complete and utter breakdown. Right? <laughs> and at this moment, what is the thing that we are concerned about? The fact that a candidate for public office moved her emails to a safer platform. <laughs> I know, I'm with this you. This is utter lunacy. Yeah. Complete and utter lunacy. Uh, you know, part of the reason that um, commercial email may be, may be safer than the .gov emails, not just, they're not just, it's not just that Gmail is not going to be the target of an Assange hack or a, you know some kind of um, some kind of Chinese or, or Russian hack although it may be um, it's that the the tour the, the dark internet that that Julian Assange uses is partly this thing called the tour project and um, the tour we were t we were actually you were proposing maybe we go to the dark internet next but I mean you no know, I want I think everyone's gonna I think anyone who's concerned about security in the near future is going to drop out of the internet and leaded rooms. No, no. I, I mean, it's not inconceivable you could start another internet that was safe. 
it would look different. Right. In well, words, the, thing I mean, that, yeah. the thing that we, that we sort of assume is a permanent feature of the internet, the fact that everyone's on it, strikes me as a ridiculous assumption. Why does everyone have to be on it? I don't, why do I want my bank on the internet? I just right, find so, that so bizarre. So let me tell you what I learned from the Tor people about why everyone being on it and the original ideas of information freedom and the diversity and heterogeneity of internet users is part of the security. So the reason to jump on Hotmail, Gmail is that you, um, is that, so the argument of Tor, as I understand it, is that they have to, in order to protect um, women fleeing female genital mutilation who can't get to, to computers otherwise or need secure email, you also have to have pornographers, you also have to have the Navy, because it's coming from an address. If you get something, a letter from Quantico, you know what's in it, right? If you, so if you, if you thought every time you saw a got, dot .gov address, you knew you were getting a certain kind of communication, and every time you got a dot .xxx, you were getting another one. What you're mostly trying to learn f about a communication is where it started and where it ended. Yeah. So the fact that we all communicate, including presidents, using Gmail, makes it, makes it anonymous like a city, makes it more anonymous like a city, because yeah. you're instantly less trackable that way. Um, you can hide you know, in some ways in plain sight, as you said. Um, it's not like you're walking around wearing an FBI badge and subjecting yourself to attack that way. Um, I thought that, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. And a lot of the people involved in the Tor project started um, doing, uh, like, d dealing with porn, which is true of a lot of the, you know, ways the internet originates. That they're like, we need safe, secure ways to um, change big, you know, exchange big data files. And, you know, WikiLeaks has done, you know, has, a te has terrible politics and so forth, but they have done some amazing work, especially at Tor, for, um, for human rights and for people who aren't, you know, don't have internet access to, s to yeah. speak out against their governments. Um, sure. But uh, yeah, I, I think, I think, I mean, Gmail is a lot safer than a, than a leaded room, you know? I mean, you become like, you just, you become alone. You become alone. Like, but the issue, I mean, you're, there's two issues here. I mean, I'm, I'm now venturing into territory where um, I probably know less than anyone in, in this room, but um, the in institutional data, strikes yeah. me as being uh, uh, utterly vulnerable at the moment, right? So yeah. as opposed to Gmail, but the contents of servers that are, that are owned and hosted by large institutions is like, I mean, there's no, I mean, I'm a big track and field fan. Two <laughs> weeks ago, a bunch of Russian hackers hacked the drug enforce, the International Drug Enforcement Agency's files. Right. And I've just been releasing, every day they release the, confidential records of world-class runners, what, mm -hmm. what drug exemptions they've applied for. I mean, it's just preposterous. There's no, there's just nothing, the, there is no meaning to the word confidential anymore, right? Right. I, I don't know whether people have fully wrapped their minds around the fact that institutional data is now, the door is open. Right, I think that's right. And I think why did we, why did we, who agreed, at what point did we agree to a world in which the door to every important mm -hmm. institution holding our private data was open. When did yeah. I sign off on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. Talking, yeah, that and also, yeah. but it's just, it's open so to hacks. anyone with the wit to. Yeah, I like I this, I, only, I like. I feel like I'm the only person in America who like, Where, there was one moment I, that's not true. I was at a conference, an IT conference, talking with these computer guys who do IT security for major corporations and hilarious, we were talking at lunch and they're not a single one of them had satellite radio in their cars. They're like, no, no way. No way I'll do that. <laughs> oh, wow. That's how they get in. I was like, oh, now you tell me. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, yeah, that's how they get in. I think that's probably right. <laughs> okay, Virginia? Yep. Uh, Photoshop. I, I um, the first talk I gave about the book in May was to my daughter's first grade class. And I said, um, the magic in the title is that is the just amazement you see when you, you know, discover a new app or a new feature when you first saw Pokemon Go, which wasn't out there. Something like that, that's just like extraordinary. And um, the loss of just that sort of depressed, dead feeling you have when you've been on the, on the web too long. And I opened it up for questions. And um, the one kid's hand shot up and he said, why don't you look like your picture? 
And I, you know, I tried to do that thing where you, I, but I, I wasn't faking it. I was like, exactly. That's exactly right. My picture is a confection that is not me. I mean, it was not, not only had I had my hair colored and you know done a, a thousand skin treatments, Picture but I amazing, also had. Thank you, Picture thank you. I'll tell. You are amazing. Picture even more amazing. Tell it to the pixels. They <laughs> just really painted that thing right. So, um, but then I had a like full makeup job and lots of hair stuff done, and then it was in a studio, and we know all that. And then the guy took the picture. He took a million pictures. He chose one, and then made changes all over on the computer. I mean. Really, I think like John Singer Sargent would have painted a more realistic <laughs> likeness. And, um, and you know, I, it's just like, it is just very, very important to me. That is my Athena now, you know? She goes out there and like takes sniper fire for me, you know, is whatever she needs to do, looks strong, looks whatever, so I can lead my life offline, you know? I think it's very important that instead of receding offline, you put in placeholders that you deliberately make with, you know, that are authoritative and a little bit authentic with a little, like, you know, a few vulnerabilities, but not too many. Um, and, um, and they don't look so staged, but you're not always vague booking and saying, tweeting, I can't go on, which I did early on. Um, that before I learned what, do you know what vague booking is? No, I It's if you put, I can't go on on Facebook or like, why bother anymore? People are like, that's a, it's almost like soft puppetry or trolling. It's really bad business. Like you say, I'm tired of life, just on Twitter, and people are like, well, do we need to call the cops or is this just vague booking? And if you're found to do vague, it's like, you know, shouting fire or whatever. You oh, can't, wow. I know. But anyway, so I, I you know what that yeah. argument reminds me of? It reminds me. That argument, <laughs> you can see the thing as an argument when it's just like a story. <laughs> okay. I was referring to the argument part, not the story part. Okay, okay. Um, when you were talking about your picture yeah. being, you sort of put this uh, falsified yeah. or at least beautified image of yourself out there. Art, 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 of, art, the National Arts Club. It reminds me in this, in, this, <laughs> in this beautiful way of what we know about memory, which is that memory is not based on your event, it's based on your recollection of the event. Right. right? It's yeah. a crucial, crucial insight about memory, which it, it sounds banal. It's like totally revolutionary. So when you remember an event, what you are remembering is the last time you spoke about the event. So mm -hmm. to the extent that yes. you change your recollection of the event every time you tell it, you change your memory. That's why as stories get retold, the memory changes along with it. Right? So the when, when, uh, uh, Brian Williams tells that story about Vietnam, which for which he was pilloried in the most outrageous way. I uh, wait. He's a the a moment of total consensus is that I feel like that was such a travesty. So uh, and so unfair. He was what? doing what we all do. But if you watch the way he had told that story over time, it had advanced in precisely this way. Yeah. He was putting an ever more idealized version, unconsciously idealized version of that event yeah. out in the world. In the beginning, when he tells it the first time, he's watching the helicopter being attacked. Right. By the time he's told it like 10 times, he's in the helicopter. <laughs> That's what you were doing with your image. That's right. It's right. right? I was you sort were of recollecting the day that I you was were, on that you place. Were, and over time, the image of you on the internet recedes from yes. your actual image. That's right. And that is, that is there's nothing venal, vain, or false about that. That's so, there's something human. That's right, yes. Right? So that what the internet is doing is enabling the most human of impulses, which is to do, it is, which is to, to separate over time our version of reality from actual reality. Yeah, I like that. I mean, third I, version of reality. This is, I mean, I like this, and I like Instagram selfies for the same reason. For the same reason. You know, just and like, wait, wait, and wait. also, by the way, Sorry. Instagram selfies I know are supposed to represent, I mean, supposed to herald or confirm that uh, th there's a lot of narcissism around, but I'm not sure. I was way too self-conscious to let a person take a picture of me and put it somewhere, much less take it myself, much less have people see me posing for the camera. Like, this is how I want to come across. It seems like this extraordinary vulnerability to me, like, to sort of get in that Brian Williams thing of, yeah. you know, but I want to be a little more than I am. Nothing I wanna is more tiresome, by the way, than our contemporary cultures. We, we both have this process, very human process going on, 
And we also have this kind of fetish about a certain kind of literal truth. Now, I'm not talking about uh, larger consequential truths. I'm talking yeah. about minor truths. This idea that we're incredibly intolerant of this, of this d fundamental desire of human beings to improve upon their experience through the, yeah. through the use of their memories and the tools of their yeah, memories, which yeah, is yeah, what yeah. Dear Dad is a tool of our memory, right? Yeah. That for some reason, we have a kind of prudish, puritanical yeah. response to people's very understandable desire to tweak. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Tweak. If I can tweak my picture on the internet, why can't I tweak my memories on the internet? I will say there was a, an older host on a podcast who said, like, you're older than, uglier than your picture. Um, <laughs> and, and then um, did not say that. he it, it ended up being like a very minorly interesting tweet, storified tweet thing uh, that you can read. But it, it wasn't especially painful. But, um, but this kid who said, why do you look different from your picture, just had a, like, I'm just curious. Like, I don't know how the internet works. Yeah. You look one way. And why does the picture look this way? And I feel like that toggle, you know, that the Facebook kids with their LSD diets are suddenly interested in faces, um, you know, in actual faces. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I keep thinking of, I didn't write about this at all, but um, it seems like Johnny Ive's biggest boast about uh, his touch screen is that it's oleophobic. <coughs> I feel like that's like a word you would like. Um, it, um, it hates oil. And uh, it hates our oil, like our secretions, like it hates our bodies, basically. And like, who hates the disgusting, hideous miracle of life more than Apple? You know, <laughs> it's just like, they just want clean rooms and clean things and just get away. And I feel like that, I know this yeah. is returning to the old 20, 20, 26 question, but I feel like there's backlash against that. I think that we want smudged, greasy things with, you know, boils on them. <laughs> That's a design concept. Rashes and eczema. I'm, I'm seeing a new, on, on the iPhone 8. Um, who, whose turn are we on? It's your turn to ask me. Okay. Blackberry. No, Tell no, you skipped one. Hillary. No. Gawker. Gawker. <laughs> Sorry. I uh, can't let this opportunity <laughs> go. They got booed. All right, I have, three, I have three things to say about Gawker. Uh, number one, uh, my entire life has been spent working for uh, journalistic organizations. And uh, Washington Post and The New Yorker. Um, and over the course of 20 years working for journalistic organizations, I've had the following conversation, let's say conservatively 30 times, in which my editor says to me, we're going to have to have the lawyers look at that. And the lawyers look at that, and the lawyer says, you can't say that, we're going to get sued. And I say, come on, i got to say that. And they're like, no, 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 we're going to get sued. And I say, but it's true. And they say, yeah, but it's not worth it. You don't do it. We're get it could be a hassle, we'll get sued. And so I go, okay, okay. I say, okay, I change it. Right? 30 times I've had this conversation. At Gawker, clearly, that conversation never happened. So why am I supposed to, I'm sorry, for 30 years, I have, and not just me, everyone working for the New Yorker and the Washington Post, and countless other organizations, hundreds of other organizations around the world, has changed their stories, not because they're wrong, but because you get sued when you say nasty things, even if you're sued for wrong reasons. You're yeah. like, it's not worth it, right? So you change it. They didn't have that. Why am I supposed to cry the blues for them if they didn't want to change it after the lawyer said, don't write that? Point number two, there is an exception. The exception is that every now and again, the lawyer says to you, we will get sued, but it's worth it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because there's a point of principle involved. So the Pentagon Papers comes along, and the New York Times and the Washington Post have a discussion with their lawyer, and the lawyer says, you're going to get sued, and they say, you know what? On something of this political and social importance, that is a risk we are willing to take. Right? OK. Gawker chose to get sued over publishing a video of a guy having sex with his best friend's wife. Is that the rock we want to <laughs> die on? <laughs> OK, point number three. Gawker is a website. If they get sued and put out of business, why don't they just start over? Like, I work for the Washington Post. If the Washington Post went out of business, 
you would, it would literally take hundreds of millions of dollars to get it back into business. Mm -hmm. You had printing presses, you had dist distribution systems, you had Labor. a fleet of trucks, you had, I mean, it, a huge, a website <laughs> is a bunch of people in a room with a server. Right. Not even a server, with a cloud, with a Amazon services account. <laughs> the whole point of the internet is if you sue it and it goes out of business, then you turn around and you start Gawker 2. Right? Or Isn't that the point? Gawker or something, yeah. Gawker. So the whole, I, no one has been more baffled by a controversy in my entire life. One, why it started, two, why we're supposed to get upset, and three, why they didn't just start it again. I think you're right. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, don't, he, I do think it's, I mean, I've worked for, you've worked for all estimable publications. I have had a more diverse tour through journalism um, and worked at Yahoo News for a while, um, Verizon, Yahoo News, possibly compromised possibly. acquisition. <laughs> um, and uh, we, it was, to my surprise, journalism had become media, we knew that, but media had, at, at Yahoo had become marketing and really, really was a division of the, of the marketing end of things. So uh, like, what sticky thing can you do to pull people in to use Yahoo's other services that will make them some money? Obviously see ads, but also, sorry, also do other things like get their weather app. So we didn't have any lawyers because this was a marketing. It was, you got fired, you know, when Judith Miller um, went to town on why we should go to Iraq. She was, she stayed around the Times for I think um, a year and a half or something after that. At, at, uh, at Yahoo, if you said the wrong thing, it was like being a PR person or a marketing person. If you said the wrong thing, it was just off with your head firing. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so there was no one, and without a First Amendment lawyer around, and I don't know if Gawker had um, ever well, had they, a lawyer. If they didn't I have mean, until one, they got sued. They were willingly taking that risk. Right. right. There, there's the downside, but there's also the upside where, like, as you say, and at, at, when I was a fact checker at The New Yorker, we actually, I heard more times people say, ugh, I hate that you're doing this, but I know you got to do this. I remember with uh, Jeff Tubin's OJ reporting, it was just like, oh, you're going to make my life hell, but I know you've got to report this. Yeah. You know? Or I advise you not to do it, and then the editor says, and we are going to go ahead anyway. Yeah. You know, because they had the, but so the upsides and downsides weren't represented you know, I don't think at Gawker. It wasn't like we have to do this for some like crusading First Amendment, this is the Pentagon Papers thing, although Nick Denton spins it that way sometimes. Yeah, um, and somewhat improbably. Yeah. Well, I, you know, both of us, I think, have been lampooned by Gawker, but I'm the only one willing to say what they said about me. What did they say about They you? said, my views would be funny coming from a dream catcher making batty old aunt living in the woods. <laughs> but from <laughs> someone who writes for the New York Times, for shame. Um, <laughs> you I love say a, your if thing? you remember that. And B, I'm still trying to figure out what it means. A dream ca I had to look up dream catchers too, but they also said something about macrame, so I put it in the city. Anyway. Um, so, next up. Oh, yeah. I oh, shouldn't have spoiled Blaster. Me, me to you. Yep. Ben. Ben, Ben is my son. Um, he, um, you had something you remembered about him. Oh, I know. So um, recently, he okay. I got him a phone, but he doesn't want me to set it up. I got him a phone. He's eleven to like attach him to my apron strings and just you know make him never grow up so I can always find him. <laughs> but he, um, but I thought also he'd play Pokemon Go on it, but he lost interest in Pokemon Go, and he decided that he doesn't want a phone because it's feminizing because only girls get addicted to their phones. So I thought that was maybe interesting sign of things to come. Um, and um, the same thing happened with the novel with a lot of um, great art forms, so that's interesting. Wait, um, wait, wait. The same thing happened? There was a point at which the novel became a feminized? It was, it was feminized in the 18th century. It was like Pamela and Clarissa and like their inner workings of their little brains, sweet little heads that were written by men. And then it, um, and the 19th century too, for that matter, with George Eliot and Jane Austen. And then it became muscular for a brief period in the 20th century. Um, and now it's mostly, um, you know, 80% are women. I, and by the way, by feminized, I mean a good thing. So I'm glad we yeah. got our phones back. 
um, from you guys. Too manly to have smartphones. How will Ben communicate then, if not through the feminized phone? Well, he doesn't mind using he doesn't mind using laptop laptop his laptop or our laptop for Hangouts, uh, Google Hangouts. And I when he w when I made Athena, I was curious about what his avatar would be, but he put his name on he made his name for a Gmail account. But he sh just showed me the picture he finally chose to be his like Gmail photo, and it's like a guy. At, he's 11. He's a guy in a corner office, like with his arms back like this. <laughs> he's my, a couple of them. He's steepling his fingers, but then in the one he chose is like this. And I was like, "Why did you choose that one?" And he said, "I took 300 pictures." And then he was like, "Isn't this awesome?" And I was like, "What do you, what do you like about it?" And he's like, "It just looks so powerful." Where I just was like, and that's why I liked Athena. And, and, um, but early on, and I think this is in the book, um, I um, was somewhat worried that the role of children when mine were born was to um, provide fodder for our family media enterprise. Um, so, um, you know, we just like suddenly had the subjects for all this distribution and display material so that we could advertise our families to you and back to ourselves as you know, being interesting and coherent and whatever. But anyway, the only thing I was ever doing on my computer during my maternity leave was looking at pictures of, um, of my children and editing them and not paying attention to the kids, just making my little movie of them. And um, at some point we were in Starbucks and, and um, Ben saw someone with looking at a computer and the only thing he thought you could ever do with a computer was something to do with him. So he said his first word, which was baby. He thought the computer must mean baby. I'm there. They are making an iMovie about my existence like everybody else. Um, yeah, that was a little bit That's troubling. The, I, but this idea, you know, it, it takes, us, takes me back to that thing I was saying with the telephone, with the misunderstanding of the telephone in the early years. That, and that the internet may have some surprises for us as it evolves in the same way. Yes. And this, this feminized thing is really, really interesting because uh, that is an unexpected detour that technology could take. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, for example, the, the, one of the most interesting things about driving, one of the most fundamental activities we many Ameri many many people in the world engage in is how it has become feminized in the last in the same way in the last uh, 15 or 20 years uh, oh you mean because we're farther and farther away from the the, the, the mechanisms of the car uh, uh, the a car that was defined as a masculine object yeah. through the first 50 years of its experience and was dis was engineered deliberately to appeal to men so it was yeah. required a level of of technical expertise, uh -huh. the steering took physical strength, yeah. the imagery of the car was all about macho testosterone. I was driving this weekend a 15-year-old car with a stick, and if you do it, you're reminded, oh my god, just 15 years ago, it was physically taxing with hydraulic steering, yeah. physically taxing to drive a car. Yeah, that's Today, right. you drive a car like this, right? And then five years from now, you won't drive it at all. <laughs> right. So it's like, that's a really interesting, so that whole thing has been redefined. Yeah. It's really, and uh, you know, if the, if the phone gets redefined for your kid's generation as a feminine object, that's, that could take it in directions that we can't imagine. Right? Yeah. It's a really, an yeah. I, I have much more, in a battle between uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the structural features of a piece of technology and cultural notions of, of gender roles. Yeah. Gender roles win every time. Right, right. I, they absolutely. Kill. Yeah, yeah, that's there right. There is no technology right. in the world that can stand up to those sorts what, of things. What do you mean with that? <laughs> uh, there, that, uh, that the, uh, the objective um, features of a piece of technology, um, as defined by the engineers who constructed it, um, are pale in comparison to the okay. power of the I, of the uh, of the uh, the social notions the users are bringing to that piece of technology. In other words, if if by some stroke of of, of some hypothetical stroke, every nine year old boy uh, decided that a telephone was a sissy thing, yeah, the telephone is going to get abandoned wholesale by nine-year-old boys, right. regardless that's of how right. useful it might be. <laughs> they will find another way to get in touch with their mom. Right, that's right. Um, the, the 
I have, there's so, <laughs> there's so much more to say on this, so we'll, t we'll pick it up after. One of the things I love, I, li I just like men and stereos. Um, the idea of component, did you, you didn't make jalopies ever, but the idea of making components so that you could feel like an engineer with your big stereo, like I put my tuner here, or whatever. Um, th there are ways that technology ends up trying to get men back, you know? Yeah. Um, so they'll probably make a phone that you can take apart and put in different ways to reflect your <laughs> amazing spatial <laughs> relations knowledge or all that stuff men have in space. We need to ask oh, them. Are, like, we, are we running out of time? Well, they have questions for us. Oh, we should. Yes. Let's, let's, we're finished with our one word question. That's right. So, uh, do you want to? Do you want to? to call me a visionary, but uh, I'm afraid that's not really true. Um, and uh, I'm Canadian. I have no, I, things go, things go badly on uh, November 8th. I'm just heading north, so. <laughs> You're going home. Thank you. Anyone else? I did, I, until I started hanging out with engineers, I didn't realize there was such a, are you an Edison person or are you a Tesla person? But I, so invention um, belongs to Edison to me. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the telegraph, um, dictaphone stuff. I mean, Edison as a tinkerer, as an inventor, was trying to make things always to solve a specific problem. So, you know, where Steve Jobs made, just where Steve Jobs wanted all along to hear music in a trippy way. It's just like one of the things that drove him to everything. Um, and he just kept and kept expanding on this, wet, this kind of disembodied sound. Um, it seems more like uh, invention, and that's probably what we think of as innovation now. Invention maybe is closer to build a better mousetrap or um, make it easier for you to get, you know, your secretary to take a letter or whatever. Um, what do you think? Done. Uh, okay. Uh, Athena posed for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the best <laughs> jam guy. <laughs> While we go to the next question, if anyone needs to quietly slip back to get a drink or anything, feel free to speak with us by. Virtual. Well, Virginia, in your book, you have a do you deal with VR quite. Why don't you tackle this one as well? No, you can't keep throwing to me. I mean, you have people that are, think you're visionary, and you can. They, and the word from you can stop Trump tonight. Um, you have you done VR? Have you ever been in one single I, virtual reality experience? I barely watch movies, so I, I feel like because they're VR so overwhelmingly realistic. <laughs> I have to, yeah, to the talkies. I have to really listen to talkies before I <laughs> get to VR. Get that done. Well, I'll take you to a VR thing. VR is very, very trippy. It's hard. To, it's almost like a, I know that Palmer Lucky, the inventor of the Oculus, who we now know to be a Trump supporter, is um, not good. And, and anti-Hillary meme maker, he, um, he believed, and with Mark Zuckerberg, that the Oculus would be as big as the iPhone. The VR experience to me is still too rarefied. I mean, I, I love it, but it's, um, but it's like foie gras. Or I mean, I, re I really don't want to have it every day. Um, and I can't, I mean, it, I did the Game of Thrones one, and I was like spiraling down the ice thing, and I, it was really scary. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I, it's fun, um, but it was really scary. 
and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think of it as something you know that you'd want to have in your pocket every day AR on the other hand I'm trying still trying to crack the Pokemon Go code I love it um, I think AR is really interesting but that's not what you brought up my question is really for both of you and that is if you had to think of or name one person who has had the most impact on the planet in a business sense who would that person be No, you, I bet you have a metric of impact that I have no access to. Um, you mean in the modern, uh, well, I remember years ago uh, going and uh, doing a, a story about, um, uh, about e-commerce. And I uh, was, where did I go? I went to one of those, like L.L. Bean or one of those places. Yeah. And um, the, if you talk to those guys at length, and they, they, I'm quite sure the same would be true today. And you ask them, what's more important in your life, FedEx or the internet? They would all say <laughs> FedEx. I remember that story, And I yeah. realized that, <laughs> you know, of course, that's not, you know, in the global sense, that's not true. Next day delivery does not transform the world. On the other hand, you know, the mail generally versus the internet, there are areas where they're of pretty equal importance. So what yep. the internet basically does is speed up the mail. Or at least save you a phone call. In I remember that was a great article about, and but, I think um, Sears was the company. But I sort of think that, like, there, the thing that uh, it reminds us is that the internet um, is embedded in a works best when it's embedded in a, a kind of ecosystem, a, uh, a pre-built or a post-built inner ecosystem that may have nothing to do with the internet, which is sort of an, a kind of um, obvious but sometimes uh, uh, overlooked. So to, in answer to your question, who's the guy who started FedEx? What's his name? <laughs> He's pretty big. Smith. Smith. Mr. Smith. Fred Smith. <laughs> Smith, give it up. Um, I, I, I mean, I love Jeff Bezos for a million reasons, but I, um, and he also in his effort to tame the post office and make it work for Amazon, um, you know, he got Sunday delivery, um, and uh, that seems interesting to me, it's whatever he's up to next. Area. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Did yeah. you ever see the, uh, the video I made with uh, Dave Hill, the comedian Dave Hill about? No. Well, it was when, remember, with the, uh, Amazon had a feud with my publisher, Little Brown, and they, so they weren't yeah. shipping any of Little Brown right. books. So we, I did it. <laughs> Dave Hill is the funniest man in the world. We did this video, which you can find on YouTube, in which it was Dick, we got Dick Cavett to, be, to interview us, and Dave was pretending to be the newly hired director of fulfillment for Amazon on the grounds that if Amazon was no longer going to deliver books <laughs> little from Little Brown, Brown book. then they had to hire someone who had a proven track record of non-delivery. And Dave Hill is <laughs> a kind of like doofus comedian. It was perfect. So they're like, the whole point was like, look, if they're going to spend the next, you know, little uh, next generation not delivering on their promise <laughs> to deliver, how do they do that? Bring in an idiot. And so it was me. <laughs> Just, it, was, it was just me getting angry at Dave Hill for not delivering stuff, and Dave Hill just kind of defending his position as <laughs> the first incompetent director of fulfillment for Amazon. Anyway, look it up. It's, it, might, it might be, the, it, it, Dave Hill is. It's definitely the true. funniest Amazon fulfillment Little Brown <laughs> yes, that's right. sketch. I, I'm not funny. I simply play myself, a kind of humorous <laughs> doer, you know, and, but Dave is quite genius. I love it. Anybody? Okay, guys. You have a question for Facebook, ironically. Oh. Um, Jamie wants to know, you hinted at rejecting the internet for both a real value and for necessary security. What is Malcolm's vision for an alt-internet? Uh, well, uh, I sort of think that the, is there a way to separate what is wonderful about the internet from what is problematic? I don't know. I know nothing about this. I'm just saying this. Theoretically, um, those people who privilege security, can they withdraw and start their own network, which allows uh, a door that is locked to stay locked, right? Like, it continues to amaze me the complete inability of the, the designers of complex systems on the internet to build any kind of reasonable security into those systems. They can give you every 
every uh, gadget under the sun except protect your information. All right. Right? And that, and also, I am continually stunned by, like, I, I, banks and hospitals, two good examples of people who hold our secrets. Um, their complete lack of interest in defending those secrets. So why does no bank say to me, Malcolm, for another $200 a year, we'll give you 2x level of security, or we'll take you offline, or if you agree to do all your banking in person, we will remove you from the vulnerable online portion. You know, I, that seems reasonable. I will give up convenience for security. No one, no, why is no one offering me that trade-off? Maybe I don't want to do it. Maybe it's too cumbersome. At the very least, though, I would expect someone to offer me that same thing, or the hospital to say to me, Malcolm, we're just going to have paper records for you. Why so you don't get hacked? When, you, when the next hack ha comes, which it's going to come because every hospital is getting hacked now, your records won't be among them. Why doesn't someone offer it? I'd pay extra for paper records. Maybe there's like a vegan exception. <laughs> like you could be like, I'm a hmm, security yeah. nut, so I need special <laughs> deference. Exactly. In all these different systems, and I will pay to be in security class or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. The, I mean, it may be an irrational choice, but that's fine. Right. If I'm someone who privileges the sanctity of my privacy above all levels, I don't understand why the world is not interested in giving me an option. Right. Right. They'll give you an infinite number of options, except an option over the thing that is <laughs> most central to your own identity, privacy, what have you. I mean, it's just, to, I find this whole thing, you know, the Office of Personnel Management was hacked by the Chinese because they had single factor security on the files, on the most sensitive files of 50 million Americans. <laughs> like, there's a thing <laughs> called the Office of Personnel and Management whose job it is to deal with the records of Americans. And no one at that thing called the Office of Personnel and Management was interested in protecting the records of personnel and management. That is just unbelievable. So when they designed their security system, their question is, how can we make this user friendly, right? They made it so user Single factor security is user friendly. So they're like, I can imagine meeting after meeting, let's tweak the website so that Instead of having three different pages when you, it's just a right. one, so you get, you know, you come right in, you just type in your email, and you're in. You got the crown jewels of the Americas. But that's the conversation they had. But apparently they didn't have the conversation when someone said, excuse me, that makes it really easy to hack. Right. That never happened, apparently. Like, I don't understand. You know, how is this possible? Like, and, and similarly at Yahoo, I mean, Yahoo. I mean, Yahoo. <laughs> this organization that, although I know they're beleaguered and bedraggled and what have you, they still have billions of dollars, right? So right. they never said to themselves, well, we could, let's just push a couple hundred million towards making sure that 500 million accounts are safeguarded. Right. They, didn't, they didn't have that conversation. I mean, did, am I missing something? <laughs> How did the internet like just skate over this issue? It, because the internet exists. To, to abolish. I mean, the libertarians at the heart of it are very anti. Uh, All of this. Yeah. But they, even it's when I was I having mean, conversation with these IT guys about cars, and how like, yeah, you know, I, none of us would have. We, you know, you'd be crazy to get serious in, in your car. Serious in your car. I love that. And like, so serious. Right. Willingly has implanted a technology in the cars of tens, if not hundreds, of millions of Americans that allows easy access. It's basically a revolving door for anyone who wants to hack into your car. I'm like, they're not concerned about this? Like, we Hacker friendly, I don't know. It's just, yeah. I just want to- I think to, there's I a good business idea in here. I was hoping I could just ask uh, one word and then you would have to talk <laughs> one word about the internet. Uh, telepathy. Tele- Telepathy. Telepathy. Oh, telepathy. Sorry, telepathy. <laughs> yeah. Would it? That's when people are thinking this. Could read each other's minds. Right. Right. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. <laughs> See. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. You might. Do you know about telepathy? 
Virginia, I handed the last question. Wait, your visionary fan left. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, to le well, I, I mean, I'm not sure where to go with it. I am, I am like the macrame dream catcher making aunt. I mean, I have some weird views, like a lot of people in technology. So if you could, if you, I mean, I could easily believe that this communication through the ether that we're all capable of um, has elements of the supernatural, if that's what telepathy is. Um, but um, but now I, I've got to give it to Malcolm. And are we getting clo are we getting close to debate time? Okay. 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 All right. Hello. Um, we've been talking about the internet and security on the internet, but uh, there's another place. There's another place that involves all of us, where the security is greatly lacking, and I've even heard of back doors being built in, and that's when you buy a personal computer. Mm. So if your personal computer itself isn't secure. Um, certainly anything you do on the internet, no matter who you do it with, is not going to be secure. Right. Yeah, I mean, it goes to the same point that this did not rise to the level of a, of a serious consideration to the designers of these systems, which I just, I find so, to, to go back, to, if I can continue on this rant, um, well, no, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a, but there's no, you're absolutely right. There, every single thing that touches this system is got a revolving door in it. Like, it, 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 it just boggles the mind. Um, I think thinking of it as entirely porous is, and, and true to the founders of, the, uh, of Tim Berners-Lee, true to the founders of the commercial web, not ARPANET, but you know, what we think of as the internet now. Um, to think of it as entirely porous, to think of it as not a space to think about security, to think of it as like Jan Jacobs City where like the fun of it is not that you're never gonna get mugged, you know? And, and it, is, it is well worth, I mean, just as a commercial decision, it's well worth leaving, you know, YouTube, Google, um, the big commercial sites, um, and moving to, you know, apps, at least for, and, and certainly to iOS and, and Apple for that, like, for if you wanna close down a little bit more. If you wanna close down more than that, just as a co consumer, there's, you know, there's Dropbox and there's Tor, there's the dark internet, there's getting off the internet altogether or using, the guy that works for Tor has a burner phone that he replaces his number every half an hour. Like, there are ways to live like this. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, so um, there are ways to live like it and not just decry like, you know, you can move way out to the country like a kind of Ruby Ridge thing and put dogs all around you and make sure the, the helicopters don't come. Um, but um, I also think it's worth asking, what are we worried about losing? Like Scott Malcolmson, who has a really interesting book called The Splinter Net, was like, Google knows a lot about you, but it doesn't know anything very interesting about you. Like, for instance, it knows that I look like, it believes I look like that picture, right? And it knows probably my credit card number and maybe the code on the back of it and all kinds of other things. Citibank has been in like a wonderful cold war with, with, with the internet or with hackers, so much that I, they err way more on the side of canceling my card or worrying that there's been an attack you know, on it. So, you know, I just, Bloomberg TV, for some reason every television person wants to talk about this dread, business person wants to talk about, are young people using ad blocker technology? It's very scary that people might be using ad blocker technology because so much of the web is ad supported. Yes, of course they're using ad blocker technology because our relationship to advertising is sort of like our relationship to security. It's like, we don't want to see it, you want us to see it, we're going to skip it on the TiVo, boop, boop, past it, we're not going to look at the ads, we're going to just read the thing, now you're going to make it bigger, now you're going to mix it in with editorial so it tricks us better, now we're going to find a way around that or pay for the content. And I feel like it's the same thing with security, at least consumer security. I mean, when you're talking about institutions, um, you know, those are big questions. That's like not securing your, t you know, tenement in the East Village. That's like securing the World Trade Center. And, um, and you know, those are things cities 
overlook a lot in the name of you know letting it letting people in in the name of you know letting immigrants in um, and uh, you know I think there's a lot to learn from from urban history um, for the internet and we may be in a time where people want McMansions with uh, barbed wire around them you know? I mean yeah no I, I think it's a reasonable distinction to be made between um, institutional security and personal security the personal stuff matters to me less than the institutional stuff so Anne Applebaum had a column not long ago in which she pointed out, well, you know, the Russians have hacked into the DNC and God knows what else. She says, well, if you look at the way the Russians have behaved in other states that they've been targeting, one of the things they'd like to do is to hack into voting machines and alter the outcome of elections. Now, right. the, we know that one of the candidates has a state of preference for, the, for, the, for Russia. <laughs> you know, and if, in fact, you can hack into voting machines, which strikes me as being, since you can hack into everything, doesn't strike me as implausible. They, yeah. I mean, is that something we should be worried about? I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. Or just take this lighthearted joy like an Instagram photo. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I think you're on you know, something. Like, yeah. e they would only have to hack into f the voting machines of Florida and right. Pennsylvania right. to alter the result of the election, right? I mean, I, you yeah. know, these are not, I don't yeah. mean to be a crazy conspiracist, but no, I, we've yeah. foolishly designed these systems, like I said, that are not, that right. do not have any uh, ability to protect themselves. And there are hostile actors out there who they, you know, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't do that, wouldn't they? I mean, I don't know. It seems. That's, a, that's I mean, that's super interesting. I mean, you know, people argue that at a more mechanistic level, the 2000 election was hacked. So, um, yeah, I, I want to hear that gamed out somewhere. Yeah, I mean, there it's crucial because <clears throat> what we have forgotten is that the, the legitimacy of uh, a whole series of very, very important institutions in a free society are based on certain promises that are uh, made by the institution towards the individual. Mm. The nature of that promise is different from institution to institution. But right. in a democracy, one of the promises is, for example, that your vote will count. When that promise is in some way compromised, mm. it's not a trivial matter, yeah. right? It actually shakes at the very core. Right. That's when right. you go to the hospital, the, 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 the promise of the hospital is that when you go and see your doctor, whatever takes place in that room doesn't go outside of that room. Yeah. That's a really important promise. Yeah. And on the basis of that promise, we go to our doctors and we tell our doctors really, really important personal things. Right. When that, when that promise is compromised, you have undermined the basis of an awful lot of, I mean, healthcare works when there's a relationship and doesn't work when there isn't, yeah. right? Yeah. I could go on. There's a different promise than, on the, on, that underlies so many of the institutions that we take for granted. Yeah. I don't know how I got in a situation where we are, without, in a completely unthinking way, placing all of those promises at risk. That's yeah. why I'm so concerned. Yeah, that's great. I think we better wrap it up because uh, probably everyone wants to brace themselves with drinks for the, um, <laughs> because apparently there's another conversation going on tonight. Um, um, thanks very, very much for joining us. And thanks to Helio.